pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Everybody remain standing uh, for a moment of silence for the sick, handicapped, departed, and our military personnel of the community. Thank you. Roll call.
is required as a conditional use, then that application is submitted to the borough by an applicant and it is required to go through the conditional use process. The conditional use process uh, identifies that there needs to be uh, the information presented <coughs> to the public prior to it being um, voted on ultimately. It does go to the planning commission as part of its initial review and then the hearing on such would occur as part of your um, process here at the council and you ultimately have the ultimate word on the decision for that. The planning commission is uh, allowed as you are familiar and you have set up in your ordinance now that they can have the basic conditional use criteria. Planning Commission can make a recommendation for additional conditions if it's applicable to the subject property in terms of trying to make that work best with whatever uh, comprehensive planning or other planning um, needs that you have in the community. Those conditional uses can be considered by you and as part of the hearing. You can accept those recommended conditional use provisions and or you as a council can also assign or identify additional conditions if you see that those are necessary. So that is a distinct process that comes in front of you all as part of the council. The land use chart does not at any point in time in this draft as it's presented uh, have a special exception associated with one of these land uses. So the special exception uh, would go in front of the zoning hearing board for any sort of decision that is not proposed as part of this draft. So all things come in front of that you all for final decision as part of um, this proposal. From the perspective of the ordinance itself, and I will wrap up in just a couple of minutes so people can comment. From the perspective of the ordinance itself, we did focus in again on the B district. It is, uh, we have aligned it with actually an M or a mixed use district because there are frankly so many things going on. We have identified some of the criteria that was presented as part of the public comment to date and that planning commission considered. We did introduce an overlay. There is no specific map uh, boundary at this point in time associated with that overlay, uh, essentially trying to account for additional uh, uses specifically single family homes that could be added into portions of the uh, identified mixed use district as that is something that those do exist and those would, are anticipated to continue um, and they would occur as a use uh, within the overlay. So we're trying to create continuity. Uh, we're also trying to clean up some of the things as related to uh, the location of some land uses and sort of the interaction of some of the industrial types of things that are happening within the mixed use district now and making those most compatible um, with the surrounding land uses in any cases for essentially setting up for uh, instances of redevelopment or infill. So with that, that's my 10 minutes summary. And uh, if there are questions, I am happy to answer them at this point in time. I agree for you really well because that's about the same question. Except for you. Yeah. But, uh, well. <laughs> on the overlay, if I may, I see you have the overlay on Alder Street. We focus on the we Alder Street. No, we focused on the Baldwin Street neighborhood. The extent of that, if it were wanting to uh, go up further, McLaughlin Run Road, then that, that boundary uh, can be, I mean, there's no specific boundary at this point in time. It needs to be mapped from a perspective of we're using that to identify that single family uses are an element. If there is uh, the desire in its extension to be the mixed use neighborhood overlay, the semantics of that name change are um, not a, I'm say a policy change. So it can be uh, extended to the degree to which it, uh, you would desire it for it to be. Uh, I, I, I definitely feel myself that this should be extended to the club. I think that any, that any question, but why, why we have the overlay on, on that in the club as well? I, I felt that the overlay would be better on Washington Avenue than uh, other than other than other than that. That's my thing. 
If you were to uh, flip those, yeah. that approach, which you can do, what we would need to do is in the, can I have my use table? Uh, I'm sorry, I thought it was, no worries. Yeah, if you were to do that as part of the uh, land use table, uh, what we would need to do is we would need to actually make it a D, we, I would recommend, based on planning commission's discussion and what we have heard to date, that an action would need to be deducted because the matter of a single family um, within that corridor is what we were trying to specifically address. So if it were the mixed-use corridor and on line uh, 68, a single-family dwelling, then the asterisk would actually be associated with identifying that in along the Washington uh, Road uh, portion and then that area defined, that it would be a deducted use. We are using it as an additive use at this point in time. You can use, and please correct me if I'm incorrect, Tom, Mr. McDermott, that you can use an overlay for either additive purposes or deductive purposes. So from a concept of however you would like to treat this uh, boundary, we would do one, I would recommend we're either doing it one way or we are just making the inverse of it and it would then be uh, deductive instead of additive. Well, yeah. but, it depends on the rest of the council feel about that. I have another question. Sure. The, uh, the 1015 design standards for the M mixed use district. Can you go in, can, can you give some definition on that? That's quite, uh, uh, in my mind, not, not too clear. On page 114, you're Yes. The 1015 uh, the section. That's right, so you, you, you just sent the, uh, the, the uh, correction, because I was kind of worried on the first one, when you didn't show the new uh, one that you in mind, I read the old one, but then Lori told me there was, the, the, the update was coming out, so I, I kind of settled down about that. Right, so uh, letters L through R was our focus of Essentially, a uh, letter L is where we were introducing, so it's on page 115. Unless located, I'm just going to call it, unless located within the neighborhood overlay that we were just referencing, yes. that uh, dwelling units shall be located on the second floor above, or, or if located on the first floor, shall be in a separate uh, unit from the business and also in the rear of the building. So from a perspective of some of the planning uh, concepts that were put out in the various discussions before, we were um, deducting, or we were adding, adding the fact that any land, any residential land use could occur within that overlay. It did not have a specific, um, any use within that district. It did not have to have a specific location. So that was our focus of uh, the mixed use. Uh, from a perspective of um, other things associated with the design overlay, I believe those um, have remained as previously uh, drafted. Our focus uh, became the mixed use district itself. So we did not, with planning commission, uh, there was not a focus on getting into the particulars about uh, things like uh, off-street uh, parking provision or the uh, shared parking for the mixed uses on the same lot, those kinds of things, because it started to then uh, fold into lots of different other articles of the ordinance, and we had a, a charge to address some specific things as part what, of When I met you the first time here, I think I'll mention twice, this is the first time. Uh, my concern was to change this zoning on very specific, and I call Mickey Mouse, a lot of these little things that go to the uh, uh, zoning office and so forth. I believe he did that. Uh, and I was happy to find out in the last minute that this was done. And I want to give a chance to the rest of the council and the public. Perhaps uh, this is all, one time they were, they were all Conditional use today, you're not, at least the way you're telling me, 
system lead of the facility automobile service, car wash. Well, I have a question mark on that. I technology industrial, fire and emergency service, independent living facility, medical clinic, multifamily dwelling, nursing home, pet crematory, research and development, single family dwelling. I think I was pleased the way they're not conditional use. They just they just come to the planning commission concept. They don't none of this has to go before the speaker before the, the zoning office. The, they're no. not special exceptions. We did not identify any special exceptions. Okay. And there are none of these uses that you just read or that are in the draft that would go in front of the zoning here in board. Those are all going to the zoning. No, 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 they're not. They were before. They weren't. Okay. There were conditional uses in the present law, and there are conditional uses in the current law. But well, that's good. And there's nothing that's going in front of the zoning here in board that would be able, that group would be able to make a uh, decision without uh, your input, unless you were, as a council, were showing up as part of the, their public hearing. Those applications come in front of you. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody Thank you. have any questions for anybody from the public have a comment to make on what she's presented? Did the Planning Commission already um, accept this? Did they vote on it or anything? Yes. They, they did. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah if I might. Um, they did make recommendations. Uh, they reviewed, they gave direction on the draft, and then they reviewed the draft and, and went over and made their recommendations as to what uh, should be presented to uh, for publication advertising, sent to the county for review, and actually the document that we're looking at is the document that the Planning Commission made recommendations on. Was it already sent to the county? Yes, and it's an ongoing process. What happens is under the NPC, which is the state <coughs> law governing not what you have to have in your zoning mortgage, but the process by which you enact one, generally speaking. So to, to make an amendment or a change to a zoning mortgage, tonight is actually part of the statutory proceedings that we have to do. What happens is it, if it's something that starts at a staff or planning level and it comes here, that it's different versus if something starts as a directive here and goes together. But generally speaking, it starts off with the interaction between the staff and the, and, the, and the zoning expert and the planning commission, and then they talk through your present ordinance, some things they found, some recommendations, they get input certainly from the planning commission. And then they go and they went, and this happened from basically May through the summer, and then at the planning commission meeting, which there were two, I believe, uh, first one got March and the second one came back, reviewed the whole draft, they had some tweaks, final tweaks to that, and they made their recommendation and subject to making these uh, couple final tweaks, that's what they wanted advertised. And then those tweaks were made, those final revisions were made, then it's advertised. And what happens is, is that you have to send it down to the county planning yes. agent, see for their comments. Sometimes they give comments, sometimes they don't. Um, and then you schedule the public hearing, and that's what we're having tonight. There's no, this is not like an application where it's, um, you have the hearing, you have to close and vote on it with a certain time period. Because it's like legislation, it is legislation, so there may be, there's been suggestions that, hey, perhaps that thing on Baldwin Overlay is a good idea, but why don't we consider McLaughlin's kind of the same area, maybe tweak that. And I'm sure there may be other comments. So this is probably going to be the semi-final, and it goes back to like a final tweaking, gets resubmitted. Now, if there are minor changes, then we always need to resubmit those to the county, but you don't have to convene and advertise only in public hearings just because you change some things that are not going to matter. If you do something that's considered to be substantial, then we'll actually have to do a whole new public hearing. So tonight, you take public comment, they'll close the hearing, and then this hearing is actually different, separate from the meeting that they're going to have that you always come to. You know, this is a special hearing within the meeting, They'll close the hearing and then they can take action, they can table with it, they can send it back to the planning commission and staff or take whatever action they believe is prudent. Thank you, sir. Anybody else have any comments? As for a motion to adjourn? Oh, if, I'm sorry. Um, go ahead. Do you have something? No, please don't. Okay. Overall, 
zoning can be a positive thing if it keeps out or if it places in areas like our industrial zone the things that we really do not want in the center of our town. Zoning can also be an impediment to good development. The more roadblocks we put in front of people, the more difficult it is, the easier it is to go to raw land in South Fayette or Upper St. Clair and develop. It's far easier to do that than it is to redevelop. Some of the items in our zoning code, as Nina says, they come up looking like Mickey Mouse. Why are we going through this? We, and I can use it as a specific example. Rather than do that, let me bring two items to the, to the table. One, we have as a conditional use research and development. Research and development <coughs> establishment, including laboratories, that carries on investigations in the natural, physical, or social sciences, or engineering and development as an extension of such investigation with the objectives of creating and creating and products and that may include supporting storage and transportation facilities and pilot manufacturing as accessory uses, but not including the mass production of such products. So you can invent it, but you can't mass produce it here. Now the question is, why would this not be a permitted use by right? Are you asking in the mixed-use district? Because it's in the mixed-use district. And it's yeah. permitted to use by right in the industrial district. Yes, but why is it not permitted? Why is it not a permitted use yes. by right? Well, in, why is it a conditional use? Why is it a conditional use? Yeah. Well, I can come up with my own reasons, but you, let me, uh, because each one of these is a roadblock. If I want to have, if I have in my office that I want to do some research in engineering, if Joe Seitz decides the Gateway should have an office in Bridgeville, you better watch out and not do any kind of research and development before he comes down to the Planning Commission and then the Council. With all due respect, I don't believe that's an accurate uh, interpretation of a research and development as applied to the example you gave to Joe Seitz Engineering Office. That would be an office. Well, no, it says here. <coughs> But research and development, that definition is intended to be, correct me if I'm wrong, a subset of a light industrial use type use. Where you have, in fact, they talk in the definition right. about associated transportation and facilities. Those are the sorts of things which, and it's not uncommon, and, and I can guarantee you that it's no more onerous for people who are less onerous than you can find in South Bay or South Carolina. And it's universally, as a planning matter, larger scale developments that have any factories of like building or factory type facilities. I mean frankly if you're making the widgets, they belong in a in a in a light industrial zone and you have large transportation and now yeah, those sorts of facilities and with respect, Bridgeville is not off the charts here. They're well within and this is not a change by the way. This is one of the way it stands by it's the planners will tell you sensible planning and zoning to have um, more complex developments go before your planning commission and your council. Now, I, I would agree with the school of thought you don't send that stuff to the zoning hearing board. They're not in the business of planning problems. You are. Um, and that's pretty universally accepted. Uh, conditional, and I will say this too, as far as being a roadblock, and Joe, you can correct me if I'm wrong too. In, in my experience, 99% of the time, when you have a conditional use, you always have a companion site plan, a land development plan. Those are going to the planning commission anyway. The conditional use just gives folks the ability to look at other aspects, larger global aspects of the planning process, the planning process in the context of that plan. So you're not creating 99.9% .9 of the time new or more onerous procedures, you're just adding breath to the, the review you're already doing. You're, so, you're, you're, you're adding a layer to the review process.
process. That you're already so conducting. That you're already conducting your and what you're doing with the conditional use is you're basically putting the ground rules in place that the people have to comply with. You know, take for example, we have the one for the auto sales. There was a list of conditions that had to be met. It was the size of lot, storage, you know, it stated where the cars had to be stored, where the lot had to be paid. So those things are presented as the groundwork and the rules for the applicant to follow if they want to establish this business. That's right. And in some, and, and those are kind of, and, and there are some that become more complex because even though they are objective, there are some new ones, which helps both parties actually get to a better result. And it gives counsel who are the planners, the planning commission, all the engineers, and the planners of council are the folks who are charged with making sure that the development is done sensibly um, and objectively. And again, it, I don't believe in, it's universal in all zoning ordinances that have this. This is not more onerous and different than you find in other smartly planned communities. I think there are a couple of points of consideration, and I'll use this specific example of research and development as to why that approach of conditional use is actually very typical for a built community such as Bridgeville or a built community that is not necessarily built. The first one is that, uh, to your point about the process, the conditional use and land application, a land development application or site plan, can be run in concurrent fashion. So it does not necessarily add a specific process in addition to the process time frame that is identified for a land development application. So they can be run concurrently. So from a time perspective, I think that is, uh, we should move on from that discussion to the next discussion. And that is, in terms of research and development, research and development today compared to when we all were much younger than we are right now, is probably a little bit different. The nature of what is happening with what we're doing in our minds and applying it to things is the same. But the, the materials that we are potentially using could be very different. From a perspective of research and development could be, from this, something that is generally or is primarily digitally oriented. There isn't a whole lot of product necessarily. There could be 3D printers, there could be all of this test. From a laboratory perspective, there could be a different you know, set of space, how that space is being used. But they need to try, try, and try again, and they're going to fail, fail, fail until they get it right. So from a perspective of storage of that kind of thing, that often also needs space. That digital type of application or someone who has a lot going on with technology could, as defined as research and development, is also in the same category, and I am going to use an example that is not here right now, but that is the Jarvis Hart uh, work that is done on 2nd Avenue where there are um, cows that have panels so that they can see how the heart works. That is research and development at the same time. They're figuring out how that technology works. The way in which an application would come in front of you uh, would be in a conditional use process, you would have a thorough understanding of specifically what is happening as part of that process, the space allocations for those, if there needs to be some sort of storage. It gives you a level of scrutiny within a business core, primarily a business corridor, what you're trying to set up as mixed use, residential and retail and office, that depending on the scale of how that research and development operates, it may be a very legitimate use in no matter what they're pursuing, but how they access for storage or deliveries or the garage doors or the amount of, um, or how the building is presented to the street, what kind of level of pedestrian activity so that it complements all the things that are happening now is a level of scrutiny that I believe is something that the borough would want to evaluate and they would be able to do that and comment on it as part of the conditional use process. They would, you would not have the same ability to make those kinds of levels of scrutiny 
and recommendations as part of a permitted use process in the business district. I am not saying that use is going to happen within the mixed use district. I am identifying that based upon this designation that it is primarily intended as an industrial oriented or um, production, I'll call it production oriented facility. They're not producing products, they're producing ideas, production, uh, and that fits within what you're doing as a mix of industrial versus, uh, again, the retail office, residential sort of uh, complement. Uh, that is the primary intent of the mixed use district. So that would be my consideration for that. It sounds very nice. And it usually does when we sit here. Obviously, we do not want the mad scientist. Or what's the cartoon where the little kid's got the, you know, the thing where he does whatever he, you know, blows things up? Obviously, we don't want that in our business, in our, in our mixed use area. We don't even want it in our town, but maybe down at the industrial area. The mad scientist can go there. That's not what your paragraph says when it defines research and development. And by the way, most of this stuff has been in our ordinance for many, many years. This wasn't something that, Carolyn, you brought to us. You didn't go through here and add these things. We tried to clarify. Them. We tried to clarify yes. where there were things that were out of the vein of what the intent of some of the uses right. were and made uh, definitions to those. We did add some definitions to this ordinance when we, uh, I mentioned we consolidated some of the uses, of like uses, uh, so that they were in general planning. You, you um, tried. We did. But you started with the base ordinance that we had. Correct. And the objective was not to modify it in any you know, dramatic error. This ways. was not, as this update is not an overhaul of the current ordinance. It is an update uh, that was targeted to the mixed use district. And so it does not, so the, the audience is, is there, it really focuses on the mixed use district, which is what we all used to call the business district, the main drag. It's the red area. It's the red area on the map. You know, that's what we call it. <laughs> that's the area. So it's not affecting the yellow or the white areas, which is where we all live. And, you know, any, I don't think there's any real change there. Um, the second area is with regards to the design items for mixed use. And specifically, the look and feel criteria of if you're on the same block having the same roof line as your neighbor or if you're on the same block having the same you know not so not epic look and feel you know no blank walls here no things in other words if you're if you if you've got a a building on washington avenue that your roof, if you build a new one, that your roof needs to look like the roof next to you. Just the facade. Okay? Just the facade of the roof, or just the piece of the roof, or just this or that or the other thing. The justs, the little things, are the impediments that stop us from moving. Okay? You have somebody who comes in and has an idea of doing something. They want to do it, and then they have to go through, you just listen to them for 10 minutes. Did that sound clear to you? If you were trying to develop in this town, could you make heads or tails out of that? No. And they're great, they do a good job. And so does our zoning officer, you know, to try and make sense out of it. I'm suggesting to you, council members, that you ask them to continue to work on this. And specifically, you know, the, 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 uh, the design standards. And look at removing some of them that don't need to be there and look at permitting things that you can commit safely. Again, having them look at their judgment, and perhaps bringing it back to you in November when you have a, a full component after they've made some of those revisions. I agree. Can I make one Sure. Um, as far as the, the zoning ordinance and the current one, or the one that is proposed, um, what I can say is when a 
a developer or whomever comes in, whether it be a small variance or something larger, by the time we're finished with them between the building inspector, the engineer, and myself, they do understand the zoning variance and they do understand what is um, what what sure. standards they are required to meet. So uh, we make sure that they understand that. And I will attest they do the, they do an excellent job given the law that they have to work with, right, Lori? I mean, you have to work within the law council passes. We have, we have to work within the zone, our, our zoning book, and, and we make sure that they understand and uh, can move forward in a positive manner with what we're working with. And builders and developers and their consultants are all, they know this stuff as well as we do. Right. They know these books. This is not strange to them. Maybe strange to somebody who doesn't do it every day, but it is not a foreign concept of folks who work with it every day. Uh, it's very consistent with what happens everywhere they work. Um, and again, the planning process just gives you folks. And it's not, uh, the difference between something that permitted use as a right and conditional use in addition to some of the, uh, the things that we here to touch on are the objective standards are Objective, but they cannot be specific because the land, the pieces of land aren't all the same. It's easy in a neighborhood to say, okay, the lots are going to be this wide and this long, and the houses are going to be this story, and set back this much, and an easy square to work with. When you go down to a business district, you have different shapes of land, heights of land, types of land, uses of land, and tweaking things such as loading requirements, parking requirements, getting in and out is something where the, the, you can't make a rule that's a one size fit all. And that's where the interactive process comes in. For instance, uh, we've had developments elsewhere, I know Joan Alba worked on where that process and for the EMS people discovered, and there was no specific rule that would have caught this other than the broad objectives was that, hey, you know what, you guys need to tweak this one bend around here because we can't get our fire trucks around the one angle that you have. I mean, that's just one small example. Those are the sorts of things. And parking, you can't be putting too many columns of stuff in the back. You have to make sure you have all the parking requirements on that you interact with your authority. Those are major plans, especially if you're putting a major building up or a major reuse, a major new employer. It's going to bring substantial people or have an impact in the business community. That's why that, and again, it's, it's mundane and standard pretty much everywhere. So none of those cannot be done in the way you guys presented to council, they have to be permitted. You cannot make those not permitted. I mean, permitted, I mean. Well, they're permitted. They're with permitted. Conditions. With conditions. Which just means they go to the planning commission yeah. and before you folks. Where they would come anyway, because invariably they have to sign the plan. They would have. Right. So, in some way, they are permitted. Yeah, oh, they're permitted. In fact, I describe conditional uses as yeah. permitted they uses with an asterisk. They are permissible. That's, that's From the perspective say. of if there is going to be a public hearing that is advertised like this one so that people can comment, that would be essential difference between a P and a C. Mm -hmm. In a P, you're not going to have this kind of no. event. At in C, you say. are, but it goes through the same uh, sequence. That's right. Okay. So I, if I may say this from a perspective of there's consideration for additional um, thought in November, that the design standard piece in terms of the nuances of uh, form and compatibility was not in focus of our work with the planning commission. We wanted to ensure that we could get uh, the uses addressed and the sort of circulation aspects and all those kinds of things and cleaning up some of the parking. Um, what I'm hearing is that if there were additional considerations for this uh, the 1015 uh, section, that I think it is important uh, as the borough, as we move forward in the next couple of weeks, uh, in the other things that have been authorized in terms of looking at specifically some of the relationships of the land uses and all those things within the Baldwin Street corridor. And because I think uh, in <coughs> frankly, that some of these uh, provisions may be uh, adjusted specifically 
from that work, or ultimately from that work. So it may not be the first and only time that we are looking at these design standards. The secondary piece of this is if it were desired that the design standards were in something else besides uh, the zoning ordinance, I mean, we would have to consider if that were uh, logical or not. Uh, just actually extracting them from um, this document in and of itself. Asado, or if there was a uh, design uh, sort of standards uh, separate ordinance, or I mean, where you were addressing all those other kinds of things. As long as we are tying it to, uh, we have to evaluate. As long as we are tying it to the comprehensive plan and that there is um, some element that you're recognizing in the MPC that you can uh, regulate, uh, form, based upon established neighborhood character and we're tying it back to that article or that section with the MPC, we can handle it in uh, I think a number of different ways and we can put that in front of you for your consideration. You know, in, in, excuse me, so in a very, in very short term, uh, when the, uh, the regular meeting will be in course, we are not ready actually, as far as I'm concerned, that better grab to discuss that, to be completely deleted, and I don't see any motion with the chairman to, to make or anything, because we do have additional things here uh, in, in, in comes of mind. We can present it to you, Tom, us, and go forward. And go forward because we have to concede the bridge bill. You know, I don't give it out to the community. We have to concede the bridge bill. I wish we were rich like Safed. Did you see on the paper the school board said, don't build anymore? I wish we could say that. Well, we want build. Since a we need this Mickey Mouse to go away. So to give the, 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 the contractors to come in and say, what the hell I want to build in Bridgeville for that to do all this baloney. So, so anyway, Mr. Chairman, I think we understand each other that we need easier, uh, we still have 10 ordinances. That's, we why we're, that's why we're doing this. That's why we're doing that. The focus was on the uh, land uses and the function of the mixed use district. Um, this is uh, an element that uh, extends that conversation and I understand you. Very good. I think we're on the same page. Yes. So, we're on the same page to make some, some. What I've heard this evening is that uh, we will present some information to you and you can consider it as part of your next uh, part of the process. Thank you. If I could, let me, just for everybody's information, counselors in the audience as well, and to supplement uh, some of the presentation. In terms of simplification, you touched on the chart at the beginning in terms of trying to make things user friendly and all. Those are very, you know, those, those are very nice for folks because it makes it much more easy for for your everybody to just look at it. You don't have to read five different chapters to figure out what you can do here and that. You can look at this chart; it's very easy to know exactly what you're allowed to do where. So that that, that I think is a good thing. Um, we talk about conditional uses and whatnot. Um, the overlay we will certainly take into account uh, the parameters. There's some talking to suggestions to staff to tell you was that in consideration that's a great concept. Probably the flag raising to Midwalking as well. So we can talk about suggesting broader, you know, uh, perimeter for that. Um, uh, on the design standards, it, it was prevent, you know, planning commission was not inclined to take that up within their, their, we did have discussions with them about it, and there seemed to be a consensus that they were not inclined to do, you know, upstream vendor upset the apple cart on that at this time. That's something that uh, we could bring back to you and make suggestions. I think council would want to hear pros and cons. Different communities in their core business have these so There's good things about them. There's also, I guess, arguments that are equally valid on both sides to total laissez-faire. No design standards, it's kind of the character of the neighborhood. You do have some architectural, you know, turn of the century type of building. I know there's two schools of thought, and then we'll present that uh, to you as well. And just two notes I wanted, I wanted to make that there were some simplifications that were made. Um, and Carolyn's suggestion on the, and in most of the ordinances, you have like five different categories of housing types. You got your singles, your duplex, your townhouse, and then gardens and apartments and everything. 
Those have actually, for simplification's sake, been collapsed into just really three types of housing types. Your single family or duplexes are still the same, and they're still where the limited areas that you have and where you expect them to be in your neighborhoods where you live. For the multis, they've been collapsed into one definition of multi-unit. So everything from a townhouse to a four-unit to a five-unit to a building are all now encompassed in one kind of universal definition of, of, of multi-use building. And then the densities are kind of similar, and they just go up in scale with that. So that, that's actually an easier, I think, uh, a simplifying thing. And then finally, I think there's some folks in the audience that might be interested in the height and dimensional requirements. And that was a focus of the mixed use district. It's a question of whether we should increase, with some exception, we had in the residential housing that was done years ago to accommodate the senior housing. With the exception of that, the, the general generic business building was limited in height. So the question was, should there be any distinction between what's in the building and how high or what shape it should be? And the consensus was, no, not really. So what has been done is um, the height, the limitations on the height of a building in the core business district itself and the mixed business district has been liberalized. So that, as always, you can build a building up to 45 feet, which is what, three or four stories? Four. Um, with, as a peak, with, as of right, don't even need to come here. Once you get about 45 feet, because the planning gets more dicey, it gets more complex, and there's more moving parts and things to consider, that is, and I think the planners and I agree with you, so uh, additional use where it comes before council, the planning commission, and council. And that allows them with objective but flexible criteria to deal with issues of Perhaps there needs to be um, mitigating things that are done in design um, and other factors to account for a, a large building and its impact on its immediate business neighbors, actually, as well. So that, that's the other thing. And, and along with that, they've eliminated the setbacks in the business district, just like downtown Pittsburgh, downtown Bridgeville is kind of like many of your buildings. So the, you're allowed to build you know, square to square upon the property buildings butt up against each other. Another, um, that's another liberalizing factor. So I think that, that hits the highlights. Well, I'm going to get down to the next thing on the meeting. The height, as I told you on the side, I mean, before the meeting, thank God we don't have the, uh, the limitation of earthquakes over here. Um, 70 feet, 80 feet. Well, you can actually go up to 110. That's it. Right? Is that 110? Yes. The conditional use starts at 45. 45. And then up to 110. Hey, so 0 to 45, you don't even have to come to see us. 45 to 110, it's just a more, it's a planning process just like you would There'll be more people there, more money for us. You, you have, have, have a height here now, it's not a new height. Yeah, we're going to have a new height. I love the way our town is. I like it. So am I. Bye. That's okay. <laughs> Will her report be available for the public? Any, is her report available to the public to look at, or is that not? Yeah. You mean like, I can get it at the like it's bar been, It's been available. Um, it's been, it was advertised. It'll actually. I thought it was on the website. If it's not, it'll be put on. Okay. I mean, you can get digital copies of it. But I mean, there is one down here at the burn. The ordinance, the, the yes. Yes. It's not a report. It's actually an ordinance. It's an ordinance, the usual. It's just like the zoning ordinance was, but it's highlighted, shows changes, and the draft updates. There's a, there's a marked copy and a clean copy of what it would be if those changes were made. Okay, thank you. I have a motion to adjourn the hearing over here. Second. We have a first and second. All in favor? Aye. Yes. Ayes have it. Thank you. We're going to break for about five minutes and then we'll go to the council meeting.